Hey, everybody. Welcome back to OWASP for our monthly meetups. I'm here with Chow from Coveros, who's going to talk about session management. And just before we get started, one of the, um, just a really quick housekeeping, we have our next meetup will be scheduled for June 18th, which is another Thursday. And uh, keep posted for keep posted for more information on that. And take it away, Chow. Great. Um, session management is not the most difficult uh, security risk to understand, but it is certainly the most confusing one. Uh, there are so many different. Uh, loopholes that require so many different uh, patches. So it, that's why we need to have a better understanding of session management. Let me see. Click here. Before I start the presentation, I would like to have a little bit of introduction of the company and myself. Overus is an IT consulting company founded in 2008. And we have a many organizations to accelerate their delivery of secure and high quality software. We have many services. We also have more than 50 training programs. Uh, and we have two uh, open source products. Here is a short list of the uh, our clients um, that covers both federal government size and the commercial company size. As to myself, uh, my name is Chao Ding. I have thirty years of uh, development software development experience, plus six years as an application security engineer. Uh, in the past. I have performed a security re review for more than 150 applications that have many different uh, session management solutions with many different development framework and many different uh, languages. Uh, I also have a PhD degree in information technology from uh, George, I'm sorry, from George Mason University. Uh, here's uh, today's agenda. Um, the first part of the presentation, I will introduce some basic uh, material. Um, then I'll move to 10 test cases. Um, by the way, you do want to take notes, not only because the this is the presentation recorded, uh, but also that I have a blog. Uh, if you go to our company's blog, uh, you will find my um, pre uh, blog uh, talking about this uh, session management. And you also you really want to go to that blog because I provide many uh, links to for you to study further. After the 10 test cases, uh, I will have a short code review and then conclusion and Q&A session. By the way, um, the first five test cases are somewhat complicated. Uh, we will take a five minute break after the third test case. Let's begin. The first thing I would like to clarify is the session management has always been on OWASP top 10, ever since OWASP published top 10. But in 2017, something has changed. The session management is no longer a part of the title. But if you read into the detail, session management is still there. So session management is still as important as it has been before. Why do we need a session management? And what is session management? As we 
all know HTTP is a stateless protocol. It doesn't remember what happened just one second ago. Um, so modern application, web application needs to know the state of the operation, especially the authentication state, whether the user has already uh, been authenticated or not. This is commonly implemented uh, as a web page that provided to the user to log in. The user provides the login credential and send the request to the web server. The web server will verify whether the login credential uh, is correct. If everything is fine, Web, browser, web server will send a cookie back to the browser. From that point on, the cookie will become the key to the application. Uh, every time the browser send a request to the web server, the cookie will be sent automatically. Then why do we need HTTPS? As we all already know, again, HTTP protocol uh, transmit data in plain text. If you have sensitive information, then it will be uh, exposed in the wire. Uh, that's why we want to use HTTPS protocol. What if we are using HTTPS protocol, but we have uh, HTTP hyperlinks in our page. Google says, no, don't do it. What if we are using HTTPS protocol and HTTPS hyperlink only? Are we secure? That's one of the subjects we're going to talk about today. There's uh, several issues I want to share with you. The first one, no HTTP that we have just talked about. Second, do not invent your own session management. Always use popular uh, development framework. Uh, I have worked with uh, two senior de developers before. They try to implement their own session management and failed miserably. That's another senior developer who didn't want to deal with the complexity of session management. So he picked up a, a session management library that no one uh, else, no one heard it before. Of course, that, that didn't work out either. The third point is to validate session at the server side, not at the client side. This is for JavaScript. JavaScript has become the most important programming language every developer needs to know. Um, that is not the issue. The issue is single page application. Single page application loads the, everything into browser memory and perform the operation in the browser memory including update, delete, insert, everything. Uh, at the end of the application, when the user log out, then the browser will send everything to the server to commit the change. What if the application has been compromised? Then should the server accept all the change or reject all the changes? Either way, it's not a good solution. So single page application should commit changes, communicate uh, as long as the, the change, data change is critical, it should commit the changes, synchronize the data with the server. That is what it should be done. Let's take a look at two uh, report, recent report. The first one, uh, it's re submitted uh, December 7th last year. It was a very recent report. The author found that there are 
he found five cases where companies are passing the authentic cookie around as an authentication token. That's a major misunderstanding of the session management. If the authentication it requires to cover multiple company or multiple entities. The single sign-on solution should be used. OWASP recommend for single sign-on. OWASP recommend uh, o, the OAuth Open ID. Uh, then Fido and Samo. Either one of them will work but not passing cookie around. The next report is submitted exactly one month ago. Uh, the author identified multiple critical vulnerabilities in IBM's data risk manager. One of the issue he identified was the authentication bypass. By that, he meant the string. I have I put it on the presentation slide. He passed something, literally, a uh, session ID, and he got passed. So IBM Data Risk Manager missed the validation of a session ID. Before we start the 10 test cases, we need a way to uh, cl uh, classify the severity of those issues. And here is a simple strategy. High severity issue need to be fixed in one day. Medium severity should be fixed in uh, 30 days. The low severity issue can have more time to fix. You may wonder, can we just work on those high severity issues? and ignore those low severity issues? The answer is defense in depth. You want to have as many layers of protection as you can. If one layer of protection fail, the other layer can still protect you. Security breaches do not happen just because there is a single high severity issue. You always come with a bunch of other median and low severity. Those, um, let's put it a different perspective. The, when a, uh, an attacker try to get inside the application, maybe they have an account. Uh, so they try to poke around find all the features, find all the problem with the application. They, once they collect all the information, all the possible uh, witness of the application, they will come up with a grand plan to attack the application. What if they found no low severity issues? What making their life difficult? And they will give up. That's what we want to do, right? Let's talk about the first uh, low severity issue, cookie attribute. HTTP only and secure. These two cookie attributes are must have attribute. HTTP only, uh, if you have this attribute set, uh, you are telling the browser, do not let JavaScript to access cookie. This is to prevent attacker from violating cookie. The second required cook, uh, setting is secure. If you set this attribute, you are telling the browser if the other side of the HTTP request is using HTTP protocol, then do not send cookie there. By default, always cookies always sent to the other side. Let's take a look at the second set of cookie attributes. Same side, 
This is a relatively new uh, cookie attribute. The first one, if you send, set the same size to strict, you're telling the browser if the destination site is using HTTPS protocol, but not the same site, then you don't send cookie there. This may be too restrictive. For example, you have a web page and you have a hyperlink that points to a social media site. Uh, on the social media site, you have a blog you want the user to access. If you set the same site to strict, every time the user get to this page and click the link, the browser will prompt the user to enter their login credential every single time. This may be too restrictive. So you, then you can set to the same size equal to lax. If you set same size to none, cookie will always be sent to the other side. Doesn't matter if it's the same side or different side. The third and final set of cookie attributes. First one, underline, underline, host, dash. If you insert this string in front of the cookie name, you're telling the browser if uh, the domain, uh, the web page is trying to get to is the same size as the a cookie originated from, then the cookie can be updated. This can be too restrictive. For example, then subdomain cannot change the cookie. So you may want to relax that restriction and use the second cookie prefix. So underline, underline, secure dash. Then the subdomain can update Cookie. That's enough for cookie attribute, right? Nope. That's one more. This is not a cookie attribute. H S T S is not. But talking about the security of cookie without talking about H S T S, the discussion is incomplete. You have to talk about it. The recommended setting is on the screen. This tells the browser to create a local HSTS database to track the usage of the page. Ever since the, the way it tracked is um, ever the very first time you access this application counted six months. The value here max dash age equals to one five seven six eight zero 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 means six months. So within this six months, uh, every time the user access the, uh, uh, the application it must be HTTPS protocol. But if the, uh, if the application accidentally put the HTTP link there, then the browser will automatically flip the protocol to HTTPS. This is good protection. There's another optional feature, the preload, you can append to the above recommended setting. This preload um, tells the browser, go to the browser vendor and store this restriction to the browser vendor side. If your application is strictly uh, all uh, pages on your size, then preload will work for you. Otherwise, it's, this preload may be too restrictive. You may want to relax and do extensive testing and see whether it works for you. Okay, now we can move to a high severity issue.
here, Chow, just one moment. We have a question in the queue. So going back to the last slide, are cookie prefixes supported in all or most of the browsers? I'm just going yes, to pop right out. They are. If you go to um, Mozilla's website, you can see uh, a table that lists of all the uh, supported feature. All those uh, cookie attributes I mentioned are supported by the major browsers. Um, session fixation. Let's take a look at the sequence of event. If the if this problem happens because the session session ID do not change before and after walking. Uh, if the attacker realizes that the application has this problem. They can access the web application, get the anonymous session ID, then they can pass the link to the victim, ask the victim to use that link to log into the application. If the victim used the link to log into the application, then the web server will send the same session ID back to the victim and tell the victim that your session ID is now an uh, authenticated session. It's no longer a uh, uh, anonymous uh, session ID. Okay. At the same time, the attacker can get in too using the session ID. That's how it happened. How do we remediate this problem? First, you need to change the session ID uh, during the login. And you also need to use 301 and 302 redirected to the home page. If you do not use 301 or 302, then the, every time you press F5 to refresh the screen, the login credential will be sent to the with server to ask for authentication again every time. That is a security issue. You don't want it to happen. The next issue is the get method. Get method is based a uh, HTTP pro uh, protocol specify that get method is used to, to view something, not to change something. You logging is to change the state from unauthenticated to authenticated. Let's change the data. You should not use get method. Browser do not expect to use the, the application to use get method to do the logging function. That's why there are a lot of security problems. The more problem with the get method, let's take a look at the Next issue, session ID exposure. The problem with this is the session ID is part of the URL stream. Most of the time this happened is because the get method is used to do the logging function. Um, the, one of the problems or get method is the parameter will be logged by all the log facilities, including bootmark. That's one problem. The other problem is the referral header. Let's take a look what is happening here. The victim tried to log in. The web server returns the session ID as a cookie. But uh, the, web, uh, the session ID is also part of the URL string. So if the, uh, the victim click a page that is um, actually accessing a web page 
hosted by the attacker. The referral header will send the session ID to the attacker's website. Then the web, uh, the attacker get the session ID and can use it to log in. That's the problem. Let's take a look. Um, other scenarios. Let's use the post method instead. Get method. The two lines of the form uh, is a copy from a well-known web development framework. Uh, if you use their feature, login feature, this form will be generated automatically with the J session ID there. Fortunately, this is this bug has been fixed about four years ago. It shouldn't happen anymore, anymore. But sometimes you can see that it's not developer's problem, it's the development framework problem. The last three uh, line are the configuration settings. Um, based on my experience, if you have these three lines of configuration in the web.xml file, Sometimes the issue of G session, uh, session ID appears in the URL to be resolved. Um, should we uh, should we take a break or we should proceed? How about let's uh, take a five minute break, short break. Okay, thank you. Hey, Chow, whenever you're ready, just give us, a, give us a thumbs up to know that you're uh, ready to come back in. And the question right now, is this the only talk? Yes, this is the only talk for the night. But we have uh, a lot of other meetups planned through the oncoming months. So just give a thumbs up whenever you're ready, and I can patch you back in. Cool. All right. Uh, before you get too into this uh, slide, there is one other question. So is it really important to enable HSTS for internal applications, or is it interesting only for exposed internet-facing applications? Um, insider threat is a major issue for security. Uh, so my recommendation is enable it regardless is internal or external. Okay. The, now we can talk about the fourth test case. It's a high severity issue. Uh, as you can see, on um, first the bullet, there is a precondition here. The victim must be authenticated, have a, an active session at this point. Then the cross-I request to forgery can happen. That's the precondition. Many times it happened with form submission. Let's take a look at the sequence of events. Uh, the user tried to log in. Web server returned the session ID. At this point, the attacker send a HTML uh, phishing email or HTML phishing HTML. Send it to the victim. And there is a hidden JavaScript code snippet. If the victim accepted the chain, the click the phishing link, this fourth link, fourth step. The JavaScript will be sent to the web server for execution. At the same time, the web browser will send the cookie to the web server. So the JavaScript is executed. 
if the hidden JavaScript request for transfer money, then the attacker will get the money. Let's take a look at two examples. The first example is a copy from WebGoat. Here is the anchor tag that performed the tra money transfer. You, as you can see, the transfer is the action. It has from account to two accounts and a certain amount of money. If attacker see this, it's very easy for them to copy this statement and put into their uh, phishing attack. Just change the two account to their own account. But uh, this is a bad example. Remember, we talked about early that get method should not be used to change data. This uh, anchor tag is using get method. So let's do a little bit improvement. Change this anchor tag to a form. That's a test two. As you can see, everything remains the same. I still have the transfer action, still have the front account, to account, and the amount. Now I'm going to wear a pen tester's hat. I see this form in the application. Oh, now I can develop a phishing HTML file. What I did is I insert one line of JavaScript code. Then I change the action from relative path to absolute path. Then hide all other values. I send it to the victim to induce them to click this. Actually, what happened was this this is a template, is a technique for me. Um, I send this template to a bunch of the developers, ask them to watch their CSERF uh, problem. But no one pay attention to an AppSec engineer's email. So nothing happened. Then a couple of weeks later, I saw the, I got the, the ticket to scan the application, I found the form that has this CSERF issue. So I changed the, modify my template uh, to meet the, all the, to have uh, all the fields there. I send the result, I share my file to the de developer. Go to the developer's desk, ask the developer to log into the application, then click this HTML click the link. Then the developer go back to the application and saw the data changed. Then he realized that there's a problem with his code. Do you see the significance of this technique? This can be used to not only to automate uh, your task, you can also use this uh, template Go back to your application, see for every form you have, you can develop this HTML file, phishing HTML, and see whether your application has this CSERF problem. Now, how do we remediate this issue? We need a second secure token. The token can be a hidden field in the form because the second secure token is a random number. The attacker cannot guess what the value is. So the CSERF attack will not happen. An alternative way is to uh, use a custom HTTP header and put the random number or the second secure token there. That will work too but do not use cookie to store this second secure token because it will be automatically sent. The attacker doesn't need to guess. 
It won't work. Unfortunately, this third approach is offered by a well-known web development framework. Um, about 18 months ago, I went to their website. I saw this is provided as a solution to CSER. I haven't checked recently and see whether they uh, remove this uh, solution to CSER. If you recall that we talked about same side cookie, that is designed to uh, resolve this CSER issue. You may wonder why do we need second secure token if the other approach, a simple approach, works? Again, the answer is defense in depth. Same side cookie attribute is relatively new. Um, we don't know whether there are other loopholes there. It's better to have two protections instead of one. Now, let's talk about the uh, IBM Data Risk Manager that missed the validation of a session ID. I have a strategy here. Um, you can log into an application uh, with a row, uh, a user with a certain row, then collect all the endpoints for that row. Then you log into a different user with a different row and collect the second set of endpoints. You repeat this process until you go through all the rows. At the end, you are going to have a two-dimensional array. That's endpoints versus rows. With this information in hand, you can proceed to do the rest of the test. Test one. Based on the uh, two-dimensional array, you can see, pick up any endpoint and see whether you can get into the application without logging. IBM Data Risk Manager missed this step. The second step is privilege escalation. You log in as a user one and with certain row. Then you try to access other page that this row is not supposed to access. As you can see, this is not high tech pen testing. This is a low tech. Pentest. Everyone has the uh, access to those accounts. Can log in to perform this test. Um, I, in the past, I have worked on, um, uh, among all those uh, 150 applications, I evaluated five of them are very complicated. They have between 50 and 100 uh, endpoints, more than 10 rows. With this approach, I was able to get in four out of five applications without being authenticated. I was able to get in. So my success rate is 80%. Of course, this is for complicated application. So the developer easily means the endpoint got to perform the validation. The remaining five test cases are relatively simple. Well, the session ID is valid after closing browser. The scenario is like this. Um, you log into the application. Without logout, you close the browser and then open the browser again and see whether you can get into the application. Before I proceed to explain further, I need to clarify. There are two kinds of cookies. One is session cookie, the other is persistent cookie. 
Session cookie is only for the current session. Persistent cookie can be used across multiple sessions. The way to create persistent cookie is to use expires, a cookie attribute, and another one, max age. If you specify either one of them, the cookie will become persistent. Most of us do not work for social media company, develop an application for social media company. So we don't need a persistent cookie. And we should not use them. Okay, if the session cookie do not have uh, we are using session cookie. Of course, then we don't have the expires and max age, but we still have this problem. We close the browser and was then it's still able to get to the application. Then you need to check the cache setting. The recommended cache setting is there. Next next case is similar. Session ID is valid after logout. The scenario is you log into the application, then log out the application. Immediately, you click the back button and see whether you can get in. There is a philosophical discussion about what back button means or refers to. Does back button refer to back to the history or back to the cache? But we don't care about the philosophical discussion. All we want is that the back button should not allow us to get back to the application. The second test case is to just use, use the browser's history tab, jump to the application and see, and see whether you can bypass the authentication. The third case is just enter the endpoint at the address bar and see what you can get in. The next test case is different. It has nothing to do with the cookie. Web storage. Web storage refers to two storage, local storage and session storage. Local storage can persist over multiple sessions. Session storage is only for the current session. The problem with this two storage is, is there's no protection for this data. If, so you don't want to st store sensitive information in those two storages. If you need to use those uh, storage with sensitive information, you better Equip the thing. I once scanned a single page application and found that they are using session storage. Within session storage, there is a user object. And within the user object, there is a key pair. The key name is row. So I changed the row to admin, refresh screen, then I was able to become the admin. For the local storage, I do not recommend uh, using local storage across multiple sessions. But for whatever reason you have, if you want to use it, I recommend you clean the local storage during the logout. Session timeout. This is a good example of defense in depth. It doesn't really protect, have any specific thing to protect. The session timeout is just to use to reduce the chance for a hacker to get in the application. Attackers do not watch the application every minute of the time. When they realize they got a valid session, the session may be timeout. So this is to reduce the opportunity for them to get into the application. The last one, 
session puzzling. Session puzzling is for it's a coding error. Um, a session ID is used for multiple purposes. There's a scenario here. You log in as user one, then open another tab and try to register a new user, admin. Of course, it will fail because admin already exists. But when you get back to the user one tab, refresh the screen, you become admin. This should never happen if you are using a popular or well-known development framework. This is a coding error because you developed your own session management. I have a code review here. This comes from a real application. The code snippet here is to perform authentication. Line two is to invoke a method to authenticate the user's login name and password. If it fails, will be uh, go to line 13 the catch block if it success succeed then you can get to line three line three and line six up to line six uh, performs a function to get the session id then line seven bind the session id with the user Line nine and up to line 11 perform the two-factor authentication. There's a logical error. The static code analysis cannot find the logical error. Do you know what it is? It's line seven. Session ID is binded to the user before the two-factor authentication is performed. So regardless whether two-factor authentication succeeds or fails, the user has already been binded to the session. So I'm the attacker. I know the username, I know the password, uh, but I don't know the uh, two factor, second factor. But I enter a number anyway. I submit the request to the web browser. The web browser returned me with an error message that says, the second factor is wrong, or something like that. But I can ignore the arrow. I just press F5, refresh the screen, they are me. This arrow cannot be found by static code analysis. That's why you need to perform manual code review. Now it's the conclusion of the presentation. This is just a recap of the key concept I we have presented. First, no HTTP. Second, use only the well-known development framework and perform manual code review on session-related code. Perform session validation at the server side and on every endpoint. Finally, perform all the above tasks. Before I open the Q&A session, I have something else to mention. I've been asked many times about the tools I use for dynamic code scan. So I have some recommendation here. If I'm only allowed to uh, have one tool and one tool only. What is the tool I'm going to use? Burp suite. That's the only one. If I'm allowed to use many other tools as long as they are free, then I would recommend Zap from OWASP. A couple of tools from Kali Linux. I used to use uh, SL, SSL scan and SSL uh, SQL map. There's another set of tool uh, for API scan. 
there are two tools I've used in the past. One is Postman. The other is SOAP UI. Um, I think Postman is probably a better tool because you, you can write your own script, automate the task for API security tests. SOAP UI I used many times, but I'm not sure how to perform a security scan for all the API calls dynamic or automatically. Uh, but Postman I only used to uh, successfully uh, for two projects. Uh, so I have some reservation on that tool, but it's free. Um, I, I have also been asked, uh, developer uh, use the zap uh, and get uh, scan results, scan report, and ask, what should we do with the report? To me, the scan report is only the beginning of manual scan. You cannot rely uh, completely on the dynamic code scanning tool. It won't tell you everything, but it provides a lot of uh, clues for you to do the manual scan and to dive into further. That's all I have. Okay. Questions? All right, thanks a lot. So one of the first questions is which frameworks, JavaScript or in the back end, have better secure by design from session management perspectives? Um, it's a difficult question <laughs> because um, I mentioned twice, it's well-known web development framework has problems. One of them is what I'm going to recommend. Spring framework has problem, but it's still the best one. Um, for JavaScript, uh, I am not sure which one is uh, provide a better framework. That is unknown to me. Other question? Okay. Yeah, we have, if web storage should be encrypted, where should the encryption key be saved? Um, must be at the server side. Just like a G JWT token, um, the encryption key should be on the server side. OK? OK. Uh, those are the only two questions. Um, there is a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of, uh, it's not a direct question, but there is, um, would it be possible to explain more about how HTS, H STS could work uh, for internal websites. Um, there's a little bit of confusion over that. Um, OK, how about this? Um, we can talk about it uh, offline. Um, we, can, uh, we can, you have my email there. Uh, we can communicate that way. Uh, the other thing is, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the blog uh, URL. Uh, our company's blog there. I know our the session management block is not available at this point, but it should be up in a few uh, within a few days. Okay. Sure. So those are the only questions we have. Uh, we can hang out for maybe another minute or so, but there, uh, rather than just have it dead air, why don't uh, people have any follow up questions? They can reach out to you again. Yes. Your information's on screen. Yes. And right. yeah, we can we can end uh, now. That seems like a really really great uh, stopping point. So yes. thank right. you, thank you thank again you. for coming in, talking about session management, giving all the uh, test use cases and some best practices. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. And for those of you looking for the next meetup, it's going to be June eighteenth. Uh, it is with Mike McCabe and Ken Toller talking about cloud security. So. Be sure to check that out and to check out the rest of our summer schedule. Um, so one more, 
one more, you know, virtual round of applause for Chow for coming in and uh, giving your giving your presentation. And um, thank you everybody for joining us live. And have a great night. Stay safe. Thank you. Take care.